Hello. In my previous video where I claim that root locus is useless, I made a small rant at the very end saying that all the techniques that I had shown are useless until one figures out where these transfer functions come from. Without the transfer functions, there's no way to solve the problem. So this video is about system identification. And the reason why this is important is because nothing else matters until you can do this. So, we're going to start with the uh, same transfer function as what was used for the root locus video. And it's a simple uh, three real pull system. And I'm going to uh, solve it I'm going to excite it with uh, some step jumps here and get a response here. So what's happening is that the positions are going from 0 to 1. The uh, control signal is going from 0 to 6. And if you take a look at the transfer function, you can see that the gain is going to be 1 over 6. So uh, you can see that this is simulating the system uh, pretty well. So there's uh, a little kink I want to add to this. It's real easy to identify a system if you have perfect data. But I'm going to make it so the data isn't so perfect. So in the real world, there's usually quantizing errors. That means that the feedback is, comes from a quadrature encoder, which is digital, or a A to D converter, which is digital, or um, you know, maybe you know, SSI, some parallel input. But in any case, it's going to be digital. The other thing that we have to add is a little bit of noise. So I have this random uh, noise generator here. So if the signal is going from 0 to 1, we can kind of think of that as going from 0 to um, 1 meter per second. And then we have an error here of 0 0.0001. And uh, see so that's four zeros. And then here we have the standard deviation or noise of uh, uh, 0 0.0001. So, This is the response, and we have uh, the actual data is in blue, and that's covering the measured data, which is in red. So you can see that the uh, um, measured data and the actual data look almost the same at the uh, scale, because we don't have enough pixels to differentiate uh, one part in 10,000. But one part in 10,000 is not an unrealistic quantizing error, because an A to D converter, uh, 16 bits, you have uh, uh, plus or minus 32,000. So uh, quadrature encoders usually are 16 bits. So this is fairly realistic. What's not realistic maybe is uh, quadrature or digital things like uh, quadrature encoders, they don't usually have noise. So I'm making this a little bit harder than I need to. So let's assume the transfer function has uh, three poles and a gain. And uh, the big question is, well, how do I know that the system has three real poles? And the answer is, I don't. And uh, a good uh, auto-tuning system will try every combination. In other words, they will try a, uh, a one-pole system, a two-pole system. Then when you test a two-pole system, you have to make sure that you test for uh, real poles and imaginary poles. So you have to try many different combinations of transfer function. Now that takes a little while running my MathCAD, so I'm going to just assume that we have the, uh, the three real poles, because if we were trying all the different combinations, we would get to this solution eventually. The way you choose which system to use, which model to use, is you can take a look at the sum of squared errors and whatever model has the lowest sum of squared errors is most likely going to be the one that uh, most closely matches your physical system. So I've got a convergence tolerance 
which is quite fine here because I want an accurate uh, um, identification. And this is the routine that is going to uh, estimate the response. So to start with, I have to take a guess. I have to take a guess at the gain, the K, which we know is going to be 1. Then we have the three poles, which are going to be 1, 2, and 3, but I don't know that. And then I have an offset. Now, you always need to put an offset in there whenever you're identifying a real system. When you're doing this on um, a simulator like this, you don't have to worry about offsets, but physical systems always have a little bit of offset. So you should always have this C value. So what this uh, system does here is it uh, does the differential equations. And basically, if we were to expand these poles out, they would look like this. But if I were to just solve the problem as three real poles, come down here a bit, then this is what you get when you multiply out uh, this denominator here. So I find the estimated response by using Runge-Kutta. And uh, I like to use Runge-Kutta because it's simple and I can restart it. Usually what happens, there's better ways of doing the integration that are um, more accurate, but usually what happens is you don't have any physical measurements that are that accurate anyway. So uh, the, the Runga kind of fix is not the limiting factor. So I'm going to start with uh, guesses for my gain and my three poles and my offset. Now I'm just going to assume my offset is zero. Usually I assume my offset is zero even on a real system because it should be close to zero. And what this will do is it will compare the estimated response with the actual response and try to minimize that using levenberg marquardt Let me show you that. levenberg marquardt is a good way of trying to do nonlinear optimization. And lo and behold, it calculates out k to be 1, which is right on the button. A is, uh, A, the three poles are 1, 2, and 3, or 3, 2, and 1, and the offset is close to 0. This is probably just rounding errors. So statistically, the levenberg marquardt system has figured out that, um, well, it's identified the system correctly. And it's amazing how uh, statistically, if you look at the uh, 4,000 points that we used, uh, and you try to fit an equation through it, it's amazing how accurate the uh, levenberg marquardt system can be. Now, if I used only one pole or two poles, this sum of error squared would be much larger, and I would be able to tell that the uh, system identification was not a very good one. So let's see how my estimated parameters compare with my measured parameters, and they obviously are right on the button because the estimated has no noise, and it, you can see that uh, um, from the results up above that I've estimated the gain and the, and the poles accurately. So my estimated data is actually better than my measured data, and uh, frequently that is the case. So now let's use the measured data to calculate the gains. And I'm going to start out with the, uh, the example plant, three po poles, non-integrating. This is my PID augmented with the second derivative gain. Uh, I covered this in the uh, previous video. This is the closed loop transfer function, the simplified closed loop transfer function with the characteristic equation. And then I have a desired characteristic equation where I'm placing all four poles at the same place. Ideally, I want to place them on the negative real axis. I can solve by for the, the different gains by equating uh, the different powers of s, the coefficients for the different powers of s. So I equate ki with lambda to the fourth power and uh, kp plus a0 to um, four times lambda cubed. So I'm just 
doing these equates here. So I have a, a system of equations, and uh, it's fairly easy to solve this. And I get my, my gains. Now, in a previous video, I said that this could be, uh, lambda could be equal to 10 or just about anything. But we'll see that there are physical responses or limitations. Because I'm going to do a real simulation as opposed to just doing a Laplace transform, you will see that the output is limited to plus or minus 100% in a real system. So that could be plus or minus 100 milliamps or 100 plus or minus 10 volts. Those are uh, common limits. And uh, that has an impact on how high or how fast you can make this response. So I'm trying to place five poles at minus uh, five radians here. Now this is the uh, perfect response using Laplace transforms. And this, we've covered this before in the previous vi uh, video. This is caused by zeros. Uh, if I had imaginary poles, uh, it might be uh, due to the imaginary poles, but since we don't have any imaginary poles in this system, this is caused by zeros. If I remove the zeros, uh, the zeros are caused by the PID gains. Uh, you can see that I've got just the, the uh, KI in the numerator here, and since uh, KI is equal to lambda to the fourth power, uh, this simplifies out to be just four low-pass filters. Here you can see I've got the full PID in the numerator, and so this will create three zeros. So now I'm going to uh, do a state, state, state space uh, model simulation. So this is the uh, um, transition matrix with the three poles. And you can see when I simplify this, we get the minus 6, minus 11, minus 6, which is basically the same thing as what we got up here. Only thing is that these are moved to the right-hand side of the equation where we have the uh, third derivative on the left-hand side of our differential equation. Got the gain. That's our input coupling system. Uh, and then we have to convert the continuous array to the uh, to a discrete array, so we can do uh, discrete time simulations. And I, this is my initial uh, velocity, and this is the acceleration, and this is the initial uh, jerk. I'm using velocity as an example because this is a non three real poles. And it's a non-integrating system. If it was an integrating system, I could say it was position. But because it's a non-integrating system, it, it, this would be a velocity. We could also say it's a temperature, because temperature systems are non-integrating systems too. But in any case, this is the, uh, the process variable, whatever it may be. And this is the first derivative, and this is the second derivative. Then we have the initial uh, control signal, the initial integrator, and the initial error. So then I run through my PID simulation, and what I'm doing is I'm taking initially the, uh, the, the target position, or velocity, and I'm subtracting out the, uh, uh, the truncated version of the velocity from the simulator, because you got to remember we don't get real, um, you know, we don't have velocities with infinite resolution. So then we have uh, the errors in the past. So this is the error 0, error 1, and error 2 after we um, move it into E. This is the integrator. So I'm taking Ki times T. And then I'm also uh, adding, this is the Kd times the error in velocity. And this is the, uh, um, the second derivative gain times the error in acceleration. So then I'm returning the, uh, the new uh, state, the control output, the integrator value, and the error state. Remember, I've got to keep track of the last 
uh, three errors or less two errors. So I have the uh, current error, uh, the error from the time before that, and the error before the time before that. So now I'm going to do some step changes in velocity. Uh, I could make a fancier ramp, but uh, I decided this would be simple enough. And I run this simulation, uh, see, for 10 seconds at uh, 1 millisecond time increments. Okay, let's. So this is the response. You can see this, the uh, step in the target velocity. And the actual velocity overshoots. Remember, there's zeros whenever we have the uh, uh, PID gains in the uh, forward path. So you're going to get an overshoot. And the, this is the control output, the, uh, the green. And the reason why it looks so fuzzy and noisy is because, again, we have truncate, truncating errors. Plus, on top of that, we have errors due to uh, noise. And then, finally, we have the integrator. I just showed that out of interest. So you can see the integrator wind up, and then go down to close to zero. Then it winds down. So you can see the, uh, the control output in the integrator. Now I'm going to uh, show the closed loop Bode plot using the calculated gains for the actual system. And uh, in this one, I'm using, I have the gains in the forward path, so there's zeros. And that's going to cause the Bode plot, uh, the gains, to increase to a little bit more than zero. You can see that the phase goes down to minus 90 degrees because there are three zeros and four poles. So the difference is minus one times 90 degrees per pole. Here are the gains. And here are the poles and the zeros plotted. So you can see that all four poles are at uh, minus uh, five. And the zeros are a little bit closer to the origin. And that's why if you scan uh, frequencies going from the origin to the left, you get uh, the zeros tend to increase the gain before the poles attenuate the gain. So that's why you have this little hump right here. Now, it's possible, if you're clever, you can modify the, the gains in the forward path and you can actually make a notch filter. But that's a topic for um, another time. So here you can see the uh, calculations for the, the five poles. And if you remember, uh, we wanted the poles at minus five. And due to round off errors, we're getting a, a little bit different numbers here. But basically, they're at minus five. You can see that there's slight errors. In other words, if I were to plot the uh, response, the poles, And show them to uh, six digits. I bet that we would they would not be exactly uh, one, two, three, and uh, I bet these wouldn't be one, two, and three. I, I think I'm only displaying things to three digits, so they're probably accurate to three digits, but probably not to six. So that's the closed loop body plot, and here are the zeros. The point of this is that system identification is key. Nothing else matters until you can do this. Because I, in all my years I, of doing control, I have never seen a system come with a closed loop transfer or with an open loop transfer function so I can calculate gains. If, if, they were, if there were gains or a closed loop transfer function, I could easily calculate out gains and uh, I wouldn't have any problem tuning a system. But if you have any experience at doing this in the real world, you know that you spend an awful lot of time fiddling around with gains, trying to get the response that you want. That concludes this video.